Okay, hi, this is Mrs. Often with Introduction to Vectors. Now, many times we've had to represent quantities that have just one component of their value, like money or like time. Time just goes forwards. It doesn't go backwards, unfortunately. But if we want to represent a quantity that has both a magnitude and a direction, for example, velocity, you could be traveling very quickly forward or very quickly backward, then we can use something called a directed line segment. And I've drawn a number of examples of directed line segments here, PQ, KJ, RS, and MA. Each directed line segment has an initial point. This is the starting point of the line segment. And it has a terminal point. This is the ending point. Now these pictures look kind of like rays from geometry, except that they only have one half of that little arrowhead. If I were to collect all of the directed line segments that looked exactly like RS, same length, in the same direction, and I said, hey, these are all equivalent to each other, then I would have something called a vector. Now, what is a vector? A vector is the set of all equivalent directed line segments. There could be an infinite number of copies of that vector, RS, but they would all have exactly the same length and the same direction, they just be like all over the place. So equivalent means two things have to be met. First, for vectors to be equivalent, they have to have the same magnitude. And magnitude means length, it's always positive. They also have to have the same direction. That is, they have to have the same slope, or they have to have the same angle as measured from the positive x-axis. Now the most popular way of writing vectors, the easiest way to work with them, is in the standard form. And a standard form vector has its initial point at the origin. Often we will write these vectors in what's called the component form. So my vector V, written in component form, note the triangular brackets, has an X component and a Y component. The Component form kind of assumes that the vector is in the standard position, so it says, hey, my initial point is at the origin, 0, 0. Here's my terminal point. If you're given two points that make a vector, an initial point and a terminal point, you can subtract terminal minus initial to find the component form. Any time that two vectors have the same component form, they are equivalent. Now there's two special types of vectors that you should know about right now. First of all, the zero vector. The zero vector has a component form of zero, zero, and it has a magnitude of, surprise, surprise, zero. Then there is also a unit vector. There's no one standard form for the component form of a unit vector. But what's true about every unit vector is that it has a magnitude of 1. So any vector with a magnitude of 1 is automatically a unit vector. It doesn't matter what direction it's pointing in. Okay, so we're going to look at this picture here. Are vectors PQ and RS equivalent? We're going to check this in a couple of different ways. First, I'm going to do the quick and dirty way. I'm going to change them both to component form and see if the component form is equivalent. Then I'm going to find the magnitude of each vector and find the direction by calculating the slope. As you can see, PQ, drawn right here, has initial point at 2, 3 and terminal point at 5, 5. So to get the component form, I'm going to subtract terminal minus initial. 5 minus 2 is 3. And 5 minus 3 is 2. So there's my component form. This tells me that this is a vector that is going to the right 
three spaces and up two spaces from its initial point. I'll do the same thing for RS, terminal minus initial. So I have 6 minus 3, that's 3, and 2 minus 0, that's 2. So just from looking at the component forms of these two vectors, I can say yes, they are equivalent. If I were to drag each of these back to the origin, they'd sit right on top of each other. Same length. What is that length? Well, I can do this, find this out by calculating the magnitude. Notice this has like the double absolute value bars that indicates the magnitude of the vector. So I'll find the magnitude of vector PQ. And I'm going to do that by squaring each component adding them together, and then taking the square root. So I have 3 squared plus 2 squared, that's 9, plus 4 equals 13. And the square root of 13 is an irrational number, and I can't reduce this radical, so I'll just leave it as square root of 13. Do the same thing for RS, just to make sure. Of the same magnitude. And that is equal to square root of 13 again. Okay, so we see they have the same magnitude. Now the direction for PQ, I'm going to do slope, that is the rise over the run. So rise over run is subtract the y's, 5 minus 3. divided by 5 minus 2. Okay, so I have 2 thirds for my slope for vector P, or for vector PQ. I'll do the same thing checking the slope of vector RS. Since these have the same component form, they should be the same, but let's just check to be sure. 2 minus 0 to get the rise and that is 2, then 6 minus 3 to get the run, and that is 3. So some horrible penmanship here, but it is 2 thirds and 2 thirds for the direction of RS. That tells us that yes, these two vectors are equivalent. I've shown it by same component form, same magnitude, same direction. These are equivalent vectors. Okay. Oftentimes in problems, you will be asked to find a unit vector in the same direction as a given vector. If I want to do that, then I'm going to um, use a little formula. So the formula for finding a unit vector for the vector v, when v is given in component form, is just v divided by the magnitude of v. So you're going to take both components of your vector and divide them both by the magnitude. It's a good idea to verify that the answer that you get has a magnitude of 1, because that's what a unit vector is. It's a vector with magnitude 1. So we'll do an example of finding a unit vector in the direction of the vector ax. a is the initial point at 9, 10, and x is the terminal point at 5, 2. So the component form is what we'll do first, 5 minus 9. That is negative 4. Then 2 minus 10 is negative 8. So we found the component form. The next thing I'm going to do is find the magnitude of AX. So once again, I'm going to square both components find their sum, and take the square root. 
Okay, so I have 16 plus 64 is square root of 80. And if I reduce this radical, I'm going to get 4 radical 5 because 80 is 16 times 5. Now I'm going to take my components and divide each component by this expression for radical 5. Now you'll be glad to know, even though I made a video on it, you don't have to um, rationalize the denominator because this problem is bad enough. So I'll just reduce the fraction. 4 divided by 4 is just 1. So I have 1 over the square root of 5, and then neg or negative 1 over the square root of 5, I'm sorry, and then negative 8 divided by 4 is negative 2 over the square root of 5. So this is a unit vector in the same direction as the vector ax. If I check the magnitude of this vector, if I square 1 over the square root of 5, I get 1 fifth. If I square negative 2 over the square root of 5, I get four-fifths. One-fifth plus four-fifths is five-fifths, or one, and the square root of that is one. So this vector does have a magnitude equal to one. So that's your introduction to vectors, their magnitude, the idea of equivalence, and unit vectors. Hi, this is Mrs. Often, and today we're going to be talking about standard unit vectors and direction angles. There are two standard unit vectors. The first standard unit vector is I, 1, 0. The second unit vector, standard unit vector, is J, 0, 1. So I goes horizontally along the positive x-axis and has a length of 1. J travels vertically along the positive y-axis and also has a length of 1. And so these are called standard unit vectors. This introduces another way of writing vectors. The vector that we have written as 3, 4 using component notation can also be written in standard unit vector notation as 3i plus 4j. So this is just a different way of writing the notation. If you want to, you can think about it like there's Arabic numerals that we write 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and then there's Roman numerals, I, 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 V. So it's just two different ways of conveying the same information. It is important for this course that you're able to translate between the two representations. So I have my First little set of problems, we're going to write these in component form. Our first sample, 8i plus 3j. So this is traveling 8 units along the x direction and positive 3 units in the y direction. So these are two ways of saying the same thing. Our second sample, 12i, is traveling 12 units along the positive x-axis. So its component form is 12, comma, there's no j here. So that means it's traveling zero units along the positive y-axis. In component form, the vector 12i is written as 12, 0. Finally, our third vector, negative 3i minus 7j, is traveling three units to the left on the x-axis and seven units down on the y-axis. In component form, it's written as negative three, negative seven. We can also take component vectors 
and write them in standard unit vector form. This vector, 12, 4, can also be written as 12i plus 4j. The vector negative 7, 8 can be written as negative 7i plus 8j. And the vector 0, negative 2 could be written as 0i minus 2j, but it's uncommon to see people writing things like 0i. So usually what you're going to see is just that negative 2j for this standard unit vector form. And this says it doesn't go anywhere along the x-axis, but it goes straight down on the y. Okay, so that's switching between standard unit vectors and component form. Now, oftentimes, we may be given a vector that is in component form and asked to find the angle that it makes with the positive x-axis. Or we may be given information about the magnitude of a vector and the direction angle, the angle it forms with the positive x-axis, and asked to find its components. So I've represented my vector v as a little right triangle here. V is the hypotenuse of that right triangle. And V makes an angle of theta with the positive x-axis. The distance from the initial point until right underneath the terminal point of V can be found using the expression magnitude of V times cosine of theta. To find the distance vertically from the initial point to just next to the terminal point of V, basically how high up does the vector go, we can do magnitude of V times sine of theta. Now we find the magnitude of V because just like before when we were working with um, finding values of any trigonometric function, we kept the hypotenuse of the triangle positive. We want to do the same thing here. Again, this theta is the direction angle of the vector, and it's measured from the positive x-axis. In class, we've talked about things like bearings. Find your direction angle first, and then you can go from there to working with the bearings. But find the direction angle first. And please do recall from trigonometry, sine of theta equals opposite over hypotenuse, cosine adjacent over hypotenuse, tangent is opposite over adjacent. You definitely want to have this little picture copied down. That's what we're going to be using. Okay. The first thing that we're going to do is calculate a direction angle. So here's the vector P. It has a component form of 3, negative 7. I've drawn vector P here, and you can see that it is in the fourth quadrant. It's moved 3 units to the right along the x-axis and 7 units down. What angle is this making with the positive x-axis? Well, I'm going to end up finding first the reference angle in here. And I'm going to do that using the tangent because 3 is the opposite. I'm sorry, negative 7 is the opposite, and 3 is the adjacent. So if I work with this, I'll get theta is inverse tangent of negative 7 over 3. I'll use my calculator to find that value. So inverse tangent of negative 2.33333 gives me negative 66.8. That theta is really theta prime the reference angle, 66.8. In order to figure out what this angle is, I'm going to do 360 
minus 66.8. And I get that theta equals 293.2 degrees. This angle, therefore, is 293.2 degrees. Looking at this, I would say that seems pretty accurate. It's just a little bit past 270, the start of quadrant four. Now, the other thing that we need to be able to do is to determine the component form of a vector. Let's say that I have a vector m, and that vector has a magnitude of 10, and it has a direction angle theta of 120 degrees. I want to find the component form of m. Well, I've drawn m here, and as you can see, it's in the second quadrant, and at 120 degrees, has a little bit more y than x. And the x value is definitely negative. So in order to find the x component, I'm going to use the formula that was given with that triangle we had a couple of slides ago. I'm going to do the magnitude of m times the cosine of theta. So the magnitude of m is 10 times cosine of 120. Cosine of 120 is negative 0.5. So I'm going to have negative 5 for my x component. For my y component, I'm going to do magnitude of m times sine of theta or 10 times sine 120. So sine of 120 is um, positive 0.866. Therefore, my component form for m is negative 5 comma 8.66. It's a good thing to do to check and just be sure that this does give you that magnitude of 10. I'll go ahead and do that right now by doing 8.66 squared. That's 74.9956. If I add to that 5 squared, or negative 5 squared, which is 25, I get 99.9956 taking the square root of this value gives me 9.999, which is darn close to that magnitude of 10. So there you have information on your standard unit vectors and how to calculate and use a direction angle of a vector.